speaker today, Mr. Wiley Cash. Um, but before I introduce uh, Wiley to you guys, uh, first of all, I want to thank um, a couple of uh, folks in the room for making this program possible today. I'd like to thank the um, Alamance Reads Committee and also the Friends of Alamance County Public Libraries. Um, they have been fantastic to work with and so we really appreciate you guys and all that you've done for us to have this uh, program today here at ACC. Um, the program is going to run for approximately two hours. Um, around 2.45 we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we will have some refreshments in the lobby, so please enjoy your refreshments in the lobby. We just renovated the auditorium, so we do ask that you not bring any food or drinks here in the auditorium. Um, we will reconvene at 3 o'clock here in the auditorium, and Mr. Cash is going to talk more about the book and the writing process, and there will be time for questions and answers from you guys, as well as we're going to have time for him to sign books as well. Okay, so a lot of exciting things in a two-hour period. Also, those of you that are not familiar with the college, we do have restrooms located on the top floor here, right behind the information desk as you enter the building. So now, with all that said, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Mr. Cash, uh, he is a New York Times best-selling author and a North Carolina native. His first novel, A Land More Kind Than Home, appeared on the New York Times bestsellers list in hardback, paperback, and ebook. The New York Times also named it an editor's choice and a notable book for 2012. His latest novel, this Dark Road to Mercy is the Alamance Reads selection for 2015 and is critically acclaimed. In it, the distinct voices of Easter Quilby, Wade, Brady Weller, and Bobby Pruitt narrate from their own perspectives and the action unfolds subjectively and collectively as much as objectively. Mr. Cash holds a BA in Literature from the University of North Carolina at Asheville, an MA in English from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and a PhD in English from the University of Louisiana Lafayette. He has received numerous <laughs> grants and fellowships from the Asheville Area Arts Council, the Thomas Wolfe Society, the McDowell Colony, and Yotto. His stories have appeared in numerous publications such as the Crab Orchard Review, the Roanoke Review, and the Carolina Quarterly. And his essays on Southern literature 
have appeared in the South Carolina Review as well as other publications. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> Mr. Cash teaches fiction at UNC Chapel Hill and in the Low Residency MFA program in fiction and nonfiction writing at Southern New Hampshire University. He resides in Wilmington, North Carolina, with his wife and his young daughter. Um, Wiley, we are delighted to have you here today. We have been very excited about this program, and thank you for speaking to us. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Someone left these uh, slips up here, so I'll be selling these in the parking lot. <laughs> if you want to cut out now, just sneak out, and then I'll use this as proof that you are here. There will be $10 after the first part of today's program, and then $20 at 4 p.m. after the second part. So the, the decision is yours. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's a thrill to be here. Whenever, whenever you write a book, you don't... You know, especially a, a first a first novel, you don't know if anybody's going to read it. And you kind of work in obscurity. I still pretty much do everything in obscurity. Um, but you kind of think like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm putting my heart and soul into it, and maybe, maybe somebody, maybe I'll get an agent, and maybe that agent will take it out to editors in New York, and maybe one of them will read it and send me an email saying, I liked it, but I don't want to publish it. And then somebody, you know, publishes your first book, and you're like, oh my gosh, people are going to people might actually read this. And then your second book comes out and it's terrifying that somebody may actually read it, you know. And to know that some of y'all, well at least you're supposed to have read it, whether you do or not, I guess I'll never know. It'll be up, be up to you. But uh, it's, it's a thrill for me to be in a place where so many of you either have read one of my books or are supposed to have read uh, <laughs> one of my books. And I've only got two books, so when I say one of my books, I should say one of my two books, because I, I only have two. I'm not, you know, John Grisham or Nicholas Sparks uh, or, or some, somebody like that, so I only have two. But I grew up, as, as uh, people have said over these past couple of days, in Gast down the road in Gastonia, down, down 85 in Gastonia. Some of you may know where that is. The room is kind of quiet. None of you are trying to sneak out, so maybe you don't know much about Gastonia. But it's kind of a place that doesn't have the greatest reputation uh, for a number of reasons. I was there doing some research at the public library, and I'll talk about that in a little bit for, for this Dark Road to Mercy, which is set, you know, for those of you who have read it, in Gastonia. And I was asking one of the reference librarians about a particular thing that happened in Gastonia. And I'd always grown up hearing that Gastonia was dangerous, but you always you know, hear people talk about things like that. This librarian said, oh, what you're looking for, that might be in our murder file. <laughs> and I was like, oh, the public library has a murder file. And I went back in the special collections room, and there was a big file cabinet that just said murder. <laughs> and it just had years on it. And some years were thicker than others. It's like, man, a lot of murdering going on in 1981, apparently. I came across an article, I believe it was from the late 70s, that said, Gastonia named murder capital of the United States. There are more murders committed in Gastonia per capita than any place in the United States for that year. So, at least in part, the things that I, that I heard growing up were somewhat true. There were a lot of things that I heard growing up that weren't true that family members told me. A good one, for example, is my dad's name is Roger Cash. And he told me that R.C. Cola was named after him. <laughs> and I believed that and went to school and told people. And the teacher called my mom and she was like, he, he doesn't tell the truth very often. And my mom was like, I know. <laughs> I know. It's weird. Another thing I was told, my sister was told that uh, a bush at my grandparents' house had elves in it. And that if you sat down in front of it and didn't move, the elves would come out. And so my sister would just sit there for hours, while, like my grandfather did errands and like left her alone and probably drank and did all kind of. Where's Jada? Oh, she's in front of that bush. She's fine. She's she's totally fine. Um, so I'm from Gastonia, and it wasn't the kind of place that had a Barnes and Noble or had a Books a Million or it does now. It has a Books a Million now, 
But when I was growing up, the only place you could really go for books was the public library. So when I was six years old in our family, you got your first library card. And as I was saying last night, there are a few people who were here last night. Willis is one of them. So you're going to hear a lot of the same stuff. So feel free to sneak out. I'll be selling these in the parking lot. <laughs> Listen. Um, but I remember getting my library card when I was six years old and holding it and thinking, I will never be bored. If it's raining outside, if it's snowing, I can, I can read a book. And I, I, can, I can go to the library and find books about anything in the world that I'm interested in. And when I was a kid, I was really interested in sports. That was my main thing. And I loved reading biographies of athletes. Um, so if you like sports, there is something in the public library that is going to interest you. If you like video games, there is something beyond video games that is going to interest you. If you like fashion design, there is something that's going to interest you. So when people say things like, I don't read, I'm like, ah, I wouldn't say that's so proud as you sound. I, mean, yeah, I can't count. I don't need that. You know, yeah, you do. You do. I don't read. It's like, don't be bragging about that. Because one day that's going to be humiliating. You know, when you get a little older and you say things like that, it's not going to be so cool. So I tell people, if you don't like to read, that just means you haven't found the right book. That's all that means. That means just means you haven't found the right book. It's like going out on dates. You don't have a significant other, that means you haven't found the right person. That's all that means. It's not doesn't mean you're gonna be alone forever. Uh, hopefully, you know, maybe it does. I don't know. How many cats do you own? I don't know. <laughs> but if you don't like to read, it means that you haven't you haven't found the right book. And for me, when I was a kid, the right books were biographies of athletes. I got obsessed with how, how much of themselves these people dedicated to being great at one thing. And I was just so impressed by that. And it wasn't long before I began to find biographies about other people who pursued something with such a singular vision. And a lot of those people were writers. And I grew up in a family that valued literacy. I enjoyed reading. Uh, on long trips or when it rained or when I was like in a doctor's office like one of my great fears is being in a waiting room without something to read and they're just being like highlights magazine or like a medical journal and I'll be like what do I do you know I just want to start writing something just so I could read it um, but I can remember thinking that and thinking you know these are people who devoted themselves to something wholeheartedly and so from a very early age I decided that I was going to play in the NBA and I haven't grown since then. So when I was in sixth grade, I was like a star. People were like, this kid is un he can do everything. He's the tallest sixth grader I've ever seen. And then when I didn't grow, I was like, I better find something else to do. Because that dream is quickly being dashed before my eyes, you know. And so I decided I'm going to be a writer. And I decided uh, to she used to go to school at UNC Asheville. They had a major in creative writing, and I, I really never looked back. And, and everything I've done since then has been geared in one way or another toward becoming a better writer or toward becoming a more capable reader. And I think those, those things go hand in hand. So if you want to be a writer, you, you first need to be a reader. It's like if you want to speak English, you better do a pretty good job of listening to English. Uh, my, my daughter is 11 months old, and she has a cousin who is four months older than her, who's walking now. And whenever her cousin comes over, my daughter looks at her with such intense uh, jealousy because she can walk. And it makes my daughter want to walk because she sees someone who's roughly her size and she says, I want to do that. Well, that's how I learned to do this because I read people who'd already done this. I read writers who had written novels very similar to mine. I read writers who wrote in first person, which is what my first two novels are written in. You know, we learn to speak because our parents speak. We learn to walk because our parents walk. Uh, we learn to shoot a basketball because we saw someone shooting a basketball. You know, if you take a, take a basketball star like Kobe Bryant, you might have heard of him. He modeled his game on Michael Jordan. Maybe you've seen the side-by-side -side stuff on the internet which shows them doing the exact same plays. You know, Kobe got that because Jordan did it first. And Jordan got it from Dr. J, who got it from somebody else. And, 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 it, and it goes on back to, to James Naismith, 1885, creating basketball. I don't know. But we learn to do these things because we seek out models. And so whenever I speak to students and they're listening, 
I tell them, whatever you want to do, I tell them a couple things. I tell them a lot of things. The first thing is buy my book, buy both my books. <laughs> That's the first thing I tell them. And the second thing is, don't loan them to anyone. Make your friends buy them as well. <laughs> but the third thing I tell them is, be interested in something. Find something you're interested in. And then when you, you find the thing you're interested in, let it make you interesting. You need to be interesting. You need to be curious about the world, because it's only then that the world is going to be curious about you. When you go apply for a job, you better be interesting, because a lot of people are going to have the same qualifications you have. When you write your application to school or to college or wherever you're going from here, you need to be interesting. A lot of people are going to have the same qualifications as you. And you're going to come out competing against the same people who are as prepared or more prepared than you. But being interesting can give you such an advantage. I mean, I'm not asking you to go in there and like wear a purple hat and be like the weird guy who wears a purple hat. I'm not asking you to be interesting in that way. But have something in you that you love so passionately that it informs who you are. And writing, which is something I love passionately, informs me, it informs who I am. Reading and writing have informed who I am as a person. And they've made me interested in the world, and hopefully that's made me somewhat interesting. I don't know, we'll see how many eyes are still open when, I, when I'm done talking. That might be the, uh, the, the, the judgment of how interesting I am. But I decided to go to school at UNC Asheville. I went up there, got a BA in Literature and Creative Writing, went to UNC Greensboro, got a master's degree in English, and then I decided I have not had enough school, I need to go to school more. And so I went down to Lafayette, Louisiana, which is in Cajun country, which is in the bayou, which is exactly like North Carolina. No, it's not. It's, it's bizarre, it's strange. It, it's, it's like, have you seen Duck Dynasty? It's a little like that in some parts. That's, that's filmed in Louisiana. But I was down in French Louisiana. So my first day in Louisiana, it was like 175 degrees, I got attacked by fire ants, and the street signs were in French, and I thought, why in the world did I move here? Do I really want to be in school that badly to put myself through this? And as I said last night, my dad, who's from Shelby, North Carolina, my dad found out they didn't sell Sondrop in Louisiana, and he was like, why did you move here? This is a terrible decision. This makes me doubt everything I've ever taught you, that you would move somewhere without checking to see whether or not they sell Sundrop. Do they sell Winston Light cigarettes? Because I'm going to be in real trouble if they don't. I was like, Dad, they sell Winston Lights. Chill out. Um, but so I moved down there to study under uh, a writer named Ernest Gaines, who wrote uh, books like A Lesson Before Dying, which was an Oprah pick. Uh, several years ago, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, which was turned into a really famous TV movie that won a bunch of awards. And so the reason I wanted to study under him was because he wrote about a place that he loved. He grew up on a plantation where his ancestors were slaves and sharecroppers. He was born on a plantation in 1933 into an old cabin that did not have electricity or running water. Uh, when he turned 15, his family, because there were no schools for African American children beyond elementary school, they sent him out to California to live with family out there. And for the first time in his life, he was legally allowed, legally allowed to go into a public library. And so he said, I'm going to go into this public library and I'm going to read every book by and about black people living in southwest Louisiana. And he went to the public library and found out not only were there no books by or about black people living in southwest Louisiana, there were no books by or about black people, period. There was nothing in that public library in Vallejo, California that represented his experience. And so when he wanted to think about his experience and to immerse himself in his experience of growing up around bayous and sugarcane and big oak trees and hot, humid weather and the voices of the people he knew and the religion that he grew up in, and the songs and the music that he, that he carried with him. He had to write those stories to re, to re immerse himself in that. And if you ask him, he is, gosh, well over 80 now. 
and he'll tell you he's still writing those stories. He lives back in Louisiana now. He went back to the plantation he was born on, bought, bought part of it, um, reclaimed the land that his uh, ancestors helped work to make other people wealthy. Now he is wealthy, and he said, this is, this is mine now. And so I went down to Lafayette, Louisiana to have a really different cultural experience than the one I had in North Carolina, and I got it. Um, in Lafayette, Louisiana, they closed down school for Mardi Gras. Yeah, let me, let me say that. They closed school for Mardi Gras, not for a day, for four days, not including the weekend. It's incredible. It's the best thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> that being said, it never snows. It's always hot. You can't get sun drop. Nobody sells pork barbecue. Uh, there's no bluegrass music. You can't understand what people say a lot of the time. And so as, as much as it was southern and rich and cultural and interesting, it was really foreign from what I knew growing up in North Carolina, especially the western part of the state where I feel the most comfortable. So it was very foreign. Um, one day I was in a class uh, and the professor brought in a story out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin about a young boy who was smothered in a church. Um, the little boy had autism. He was a young boy who was 12 years old. And the people at this church decided they were going to heal him of his autism. And so they decided they were going to lay hands on him. And some of y'all might have been raised in that tradition where you know laying hands on somebody is an act of communal, you know, power or fellowship or, or connection. And this little boy didn't want to be touched, and so he fought with them. And they laid him down on the floor at the front of the church and held him down so more people could lay their hands on him. When he tried to get up, they laid across his body, and more and more men from the church came and laid down on top of him, and they ended up killing him. And I was really intrigued by that boy's story. Um, I was raised in a charismatic uh, evangelical church, a Southern Baptist church. As I said last night, that means that I can't dance. And I talk really loud when I get excited. And sometimes I'll just say, Jesus! <laughs> Some of y'all been to that church where you're like nodding off. And your preacher's like, then the devil said, no! And you're like, whoa, whoa! And you're like... You're like having a dream about eating something, you think you're spilling on yourself, and you don't know where you are. And that's the kind of church I was raised in. You might, you might, you might know that church. Or somebody, you just walk in and they start taking up their collection plate, and they'll look at it, and they'll just like, they just send it back out, you know. I said, we're going to take it, send it around one more time, and we got to do better than that. Um, but that's the kind of church I was raised in, so I was, I was curious about this church where this group of believers would believe something to death where they would literally take their beliefs to a degree where someone died as a result of what they believed. And so I wanted to tell that little boy's story, but I'd never been to Milwaukee. Um, I didn't know what kind of churches they had there. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know really what kind of church this would occur in. But I knew what kind of church this would occur in in North Carolina. It would be a traditional church, a conservative church, a historic church, what's known as a holiness church, a Pentecostal church, maybe a signs-following church, which means you follow the signs of, in the Bible, particular signs. And I said, well, they have those kind of churches in western North Carolina, in particular in Madison County, that I'm, where I'm very familiar with after living in the mountains for so long. And so I picked that story up out of Milwaukee from Louisiana, and I put it in North Carolina. And when I did that, I was able to do what Ernest Gaines did when he left southwest Louisiana. I was able to recreate a place that I knew, place that I loved, a place where the voices were there that I missed, a place that I missed the landscape and the weather and the feel and the language and the music. So I got to live in Lafayette, Louisiana, where you have 11 and a half months of summer, two weeks of fall, an afternoon of winter, and six and a half days of spring. And I got to have snow and fresh water. I got to have Mardi Gras, and I got to have all of these things back home that I missed whenever I sat down to write. And it reminded me of being young, that when I had my library card, I said, I will never be bored because I can always immerse myself in a book. And now, as an adult, as a writer, I can always immerse myself either in the book I'm reading or in the book that I'm writing. And I really want the reader's experience when they read my books 
to be that of stepping into something and then stepping out of something, to be able to lose yourself in the experience uh, of reading. Because uh, reading has done that for me and it's allowed me to, uh, to check out of life sometimes. Some of the hardest times in my life, I can remember what I was reading. Um, and maybe, maybe some of you have experienced that as well. But I thought I'd read a little bit uh, from my first novel um, to give you a sense of, of, of what this novel is about and, and, and what, the, what the voices sound like. So this novel is about the fallout in the community in the mountains of North Carolina after a young boy is smothered during a healing service. And it's got three narrators. The first is the boy's younger brother. He is nine years old. He harbors horrible secrets about the reasons his, his older brother, who's never spoken before, was inside this church. He knows things about his mother that his father does not know. And because he's nine, he perceives so much less than he understands. He, he understands so much, so little of what he actually perceives. The second narrator is a, a woman who's 81 years old. She knows the history of the church. She knows why these people are so intimidated by this mysterious minister who showed up handling snakes and drinking poison and handling fire and all these things. And the third narrator is a local sheriff who after this boy dies mysteriously in this church has to find out what is he doing inside a building that has a newspaper over the windows? Why will nobody talk about this tragedy? Why is the boy's mother not making herself available? And so this is a scene from the novel uh, where the sheriff is thinking about the first time. The sheriff's middle age, he's in his 60s, he's about to retire. But he's thinking about the first time he ever heard the name Carson Chambers, and that is the minister of this church where this young boy has died. Carson Chambliss suddenly showed up on the radar of the Madison County Sheriff's Department, and he'd been there ever since. He didn't seem to have any connections to the area, and there wasn't any family in this part of North Carolina that I could find. I called on a couple of folks around here who I had trusted, who I knew could keep their mouths shut about these kind of things, and I found out he'd come up from North Georgia, Stevens County, about three hours southwest of here. It took a few phone calls, but it wasn't hardly a day or two before I was on the phone with Sheriff Tyree Nix in Toccoa, Georgia, asking him if he'd ever heard of a man named Carson Chambers. Good God, he said. Who hadn't heard of that son of a bitch? Nix said. Nix said Chambers always told folks that he was a mechanic, but all Nix had ever known him for was being arrested on little charges like petty theft and possession of marijuana and controlled substances. I'd had my eye on him for a long time, Nix said, but... He had to go and blow himself up for us to have something that would stick. What do you mean, I asked. Well, he cooked meth, Nick said. And he moved like a squatter back and forth between shacks and abandoned trailers, and we couldn't ever catch him. And then one morning we had an old house explode about ten minutes outside Dakota. It was Chambliss, what was left of him anyway. Was he hurt bad, I asked. You ain't never seen him up close, have you, he asked me. No, Sheriff, I said, I haven't. The truth was that at that time I hadn't laid my eyes on him yet. I couldn't have picked Carson Chambliss out of a crowd of two men. Well, that explosion took off something like 40% of his skin, Nick said. It almost killed him. They had to grab big old pieces from his legs and his back. He must have worn a gas mask or something over his face while he cooked, because you can't quite tell it just by looking at him. But his chest and the right side of his body are just awful looking. If you saw him without his clothes on, you'd swear he was a dang mutant. He sighed like he was about to tell me something he either shouldn't or didn't want to. You want to hear the messed up part, he asked. I sure do, I said. He had him a 16-year-old girl in that house when it exploded. A runaway from Mississippi. She died a week later from her burns. Her folks drove up here from Jackson and took her home. It was just a sad story all the way around. What happened to Chambliss, I asked. We tried to get him on second degree murder, but you know how it is, Sheriff. His coin imported suit got it argued down to involuntary manslaughter. The newspaper made that poor girl sound like a conspirator. They only gave him three years. I think he might have served two. That don't seem right, I said. It wasn't right, he said, but like I told you, you know how it is. It was quiet for a second, and I thought he'd finish telling me all he knew about Chambliss. Then he cleared his throat. You want to know something else? After he got sent to the Allendale pen down in Alto, he was explaining away those burns by telling folks that God had done it to him. 
He told him that the hand of God Almighty had come down and set his body afire to purify him from the sins of the world. But what about the meth explosion, I asked. What, what do you have to say about that? He said that was how God chose to do it. And what about that girl? He didn't ever mention her. Then after he got to the pen anyway, it was just like she never existed, he said. But let me tell you this. And you ain't going to believe it when I tell you. But the warden said he couldn't hardly keep that man from setting himself on fire once he got inside the pen. Warden said Chambliss started up some kind of cult called the Science Following. He said they'd hold services right there on the spot, wherever they felt moved. The chapel, in their cells, out in the yard. He said they'd speak in tongues, heal each other, talk about the devil like he lived next door. But the thing was, once they got going, they'd pull out anything flammable they could get a hold of and light it on fire and run their hands over it. Hold it right up to their faces. Shaving cream, cologne, clean and spray. He said if he confiscated lighters and matchbooks to try and keep them from setting that stuff on fire, they'd up and drink it. Not a single one of them psychos was burned or ever got sick. He said Chambliss got him a little following together, and there was nothing outside of solitary confinement that would keep those folks from getting to him. He couldn't get nothing out of Chambliss that would explain why they were carrying on like that, but one of his followers told him that it was in the Bible. That Jesus told the disciples that after he was gone, they'd be able to do all kinds of dangerous things without getting hurt. He said it would be a sign of their righteousness. I didn't believe him until I got home and opened up my own Bible and did a little searching. And there it was, right there in Mark, just like they said it would be. I heard his desk chair squeak, and I imagined Sheriff Nix leaning all the way back, his boots up on the desk, crossed at the ankle, his hat resting in his lap. When he mentioned the book of Mark, my mind suddenly recalled the new sign out by the front of Chambliss' church. I recalled the exact verses on it. Mark 16, 17 through 18. I hung up with Nick, and when I got home that night, I took Sheila's Bible out of her nightstand and flipped through the pages until I found the verses and whispered out loud as I read them. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick, and they will get well. Things became clearer to me once I read that. A bad burn from a meth house explosion in North Georgia becomes a sign of holiness and power in Western North Carolina. It was all in who told the story, even if that story involved a dead young girl from Mississippi. I suddenly understood the kind of mind that could convince Gillum to set his barn on fire, and I suddenly understood why a group of folks would hide behind newspaper-covered windows while they worshipped. And I finally realized it was in those little crates they carried in and out of that church on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Rather than suspicion, what did I have? What could I do? Arrest a man for exercising his religious freedom? None of it was a reason to knock on church doors, interrupt meetings and services. But now, this time, it wasn't a 16-year-old runaway, but a 13-year-old mute boy who was dead. A boy who couldn't have told Chambliss yes or no or stopped, even if he wanted to. This time, I knew it was different. So the book is hilarious, really lighthearted, <laughs> no tragedy, no darkness, no evil, no snakes. There's, very, there's actually surprisingly little amount of snakes in, in the book. I don't like snakes either. So I wrote a Landmore Kind at home when I was living in Lafayette, Louisiana because I missed North Carolina. And then once I got out, I got a job in West Virginia and I started missing North Carolina again. And I started writing uh, a second novel, a Landmore Kind at home. I got dropped by an agent. After two years, she was never able to sell it. And so I said, wow, that was a waste of time. Um, I'm going to try to write a second book and see if I can waste my time there as well. And I remember the story my wife told me about playing softball when she was a little girl. As I said last night, according to my wife, she was an amazing softball player as a very young child. I've seen no video. I've seen no statistics. I've seen no family stories to back up this claim. But according to her, her only weakness was that she didn't know how to slide into base. And so in the summertime, her dad would get off work and they would go to the baseball field near her neighborhood and they would practice sliding into base. And I thought that was such a beautiful image to see a father and a daughter on a baseball field at dusk in the summertime. And it really stayed with me. But I didn't want to write a story that was real happy, because that's not interesting. 
when your friend comes home or come, your, your roommate or your girlfriend, boyfriend, and they, they're just like, oh my gosh, I had the best day. Are you like, I, I'm dying to hear this story. You're like, I don't care. But you got a good sandwich and found some money on the sidewalk. Yeah. When somebody comes home and they're like, this has been the worst day of my life. You're like, ooh, speak up. <laughs> I want to hear this. You know, the happy stuff. We think we love it, but we don't love it so much. You know, we, we get a little immune to it. And I think without the darkness, without the, the hopelessness, we have no hope. You know, if all we have is hope, we overlook it, we take it for granted, we just put it in our pocket and go about our day without a clear awareness of how grateful we should be to live in a great town like Graham, be at a great school like this, in a wonderful state, in an amazing country, at like the best time ever to be alive, right? You don't wake up in the morning thinking about that. But the minute something threatens that, you think, ooh, I need to change something. My way of life is being threatened one way or another. And so I thought, well, maybe this, this little girl and her dad don't like each other. Maybe he's run out on the family. Maybe, maybe she's in a foster home. Maybe her mother's dead. Maybe she has a little sister. And I started thinking about these two young girls that I knew growing up in Gastonia. They went to my church. They were 15 and 12, and I was 15 at the time. And they were being raised by a foster family, this older couple at my church. And when they were 15 and 12, the girls went to live with their birth mother. And they ended up being murdered by two guys they were dating. The 12-year-old's boyfriend was in his 20s. Uh, I'm sorry, the 15-year-old's boyfriend was in his 20s, and the 12-year-old's boyfriend was in his 30s. And these guys picked them up at their mother's house one night, accused the girls of stealing money from them, uh, violently killed them, tried to hide their bodies, and they, they were called immediately. That, that's the research I was doing at the library when she showed me the murder file. I was researching the, the, the tragedy of these girls. And they were 15 and 12 when this happened, and I was 15 when this happened. This was the first person I'd ever known who died, much less who had been murdered, right? And these were girls who were born into a certain set of circumstances whose lives almost could not have ended up any other way because of the unluck of their birth. They were not born into a home where their mother or father had it together enough to keep them together. Uh, they were not born into a home where education and reading and values and, and social awareness were encouraged. I was. I'm lucky. I was born into a home where I had examples. Not all of us are. I mean, America is the land of the free and the home of the brave and the land of opportunity. But so often we forget and overlook the fact, especially around campaign season, that not everybody is born into the same set of opportunities. So we are all born equal, but we are all not born equally, I do not believe. And so the tragedy of these girls' lives, it always stayed with me. So when I was thinking of this very touching image of this father and daughter at the baseball field, I couldn't help but coupling it with this very tragic real-life story of these two girls who lost their lives, really by no fault of their own. That's how their lives ended up. And I wanted to, to bring awareness to the roles that that families and lacks of families play in people's lives. And that's where the idea of this story came from. And I knew very early on that it was going to open with Easter standing on third base. I knew that very early on. I heard her voice immediately. And so when I thought A Land More Kind Than Home was a failed novel, that's when an agent contacted me and said, I'd like to represent this book. Do you have an idea for a second novel? And I hadn't written dark road yet. And I said, I do have an idea for a second novel. It's about a little girl. She's 12. She's standing on third base. She hates her dad, and her dad knows Sammy Sosa. And my agent was like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> that sounds like the worst book ever. And I was like, I can do it. I can, I can make it better. And so when A Land More Kind Than Home sold, it sold as a completed manuscript with a one-page synopsis of this dark road to mercy. So this book that I wrote in obscurity that I thought no one would ever read um, is the one that allowed me to write this book that I wrote under the pressure of knowing not only were people going to read it, people were going to read the book that came before it. So it was a different, 
a different kind of feeling uh, going into the second one than it was the first one. Um, I'm wondering, it's 2.45, if we should take a break now? Or oh, I can take questions if people... Yeah, does anybody have any, any questions about anything I've said? We can take two or three questions and then maybe take a break and come back in at three. Yes. Yes. She asked about how do you develop a personality without it being flatlined. And, you know, I want to write books. Like, there are books like Nicholas Sparks or uh, Tom Clancy or Dean Koontz where you read it for the story, right? And those characters could be anybody. It's just got to be like a guy with a broken heart and a girl with a broken heart. And they meet at the Fourth of July Festival. But one of them's got a crazy ex-boyfriend. Like, that could be anybody, right? That could be any of you. You might be the crazy ex-boyfriend. Um, <laughs> But I like to write novels and read novels where the characters have to be particular people. Like Wade can only be Wade, right? There's only one. You might know Wade. Some of you probably, he probably Wade probably owes you money, right? There can only be one Wade, there can only be one Eastern, there can only, can only be one Pruitt. But that being said, certainly these creations have models for my life. You know, uh, things I've seen, things I've experienced, things I've read. Um, I think writing fiction is just the, the task of rearranging your memory and your experience and fictionalizing it in many ways. But, you know, I want to write characters that I believe in enough to spend time with, who are multidimensional enough to where I'm not going to be bored by them, and I'm not ever going to know what they're going to do next. Like, people last night were asking me, you know, what happens at the end of the story? I'm like, I don't know, it ends. I don't know what happens beyond that because I don't know. You know, I don't. I don't know what these characters are going to do because they're unpredictable to me. They're real people to me, and that makes you sound crazy when you've created them. You know, I, I do what the voices in my head tell me to do, right? So I, I want to create characters I believe in. That's the best answer I can. And some of them are modeled on people I know. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure, yeah. So, and can you speak to what your She asked about the violent death of Wade's mother. Um, and and, and, and it, it was toned down a lot from what it originally was, uh, which makes me, again, sound crazy. But um, I wanted there to be fear in the novel. You know, I wanted there to be real fear of this guy. And so many times during the novel, you almost see what Pruitt's capable of. You almost see it, but you never quite see it. And there I wanted it to be apparent. And I wanted it to be on someone who didn't deserve it, right? So if he were to catch Wade, what's going to happen to Wade if he feels Wade actually deserves this, you know? And I know it's dark, it's very uncomfortable. Um, but it, it just it just ended up there. It's still my wife still that still bothers her. Like I would, she was reading a lot of the novels I was writing it. She would just say, I just don't want to read this part again. I just get get your agent or editor. They can. I just want to read this part again. And it, it, it and it was toned down. Um, there were a number of scenes in the novel that were cut with Pruitt just being incredibly violent. And the reason my editor and I decided to cut them was once you reach the pinnacle of violence. There's nowhere to go. So you either go straight across in the violence, and it becomes, you become numb to it, right? Like, um, for example, a school shooting. When somebody's like, did you hear about the school shooting? I'm like, oh, which one? Let's play the guessing game of which shooting we've allowed to happen in this country. We're like numb to it. We're not, we're, unless like 40 people, we don't even respond. We don't even think about it, right? Because it's happened so frequently. But Columbine, I remember standing in my dorm room my sophomore year of college, just in tears, just thinking, how could this happen? How, how is this possible? Watching it on my TV in the middle of the day. Um, so I wanted Pruitt to do that one thing of such intense darkness that it was a pop of a shock, you know. 
Um, but it was uncomfortable to write. It's, it's uncomfortable to read. Yes. Are you a writer? Yeah. She asked, she asked what, is your, what is your process of coming up with the plot, and how do you build in suspension and, and mystery and things like that? I don't think I'm a mystery writer. I don't think I'm smart enough to be a mystery writer because I'm not smart enough to fool you, the reader, and obscure you from knowing something. That's what mysteries do. You get to the end, and you're like, I never saw that coming. But my books, like, you know. You know what's happened, but the characters don't know what's happened. Like, Brady's looking for Easter and, and Ruby, but you know where they are. Pruitt's looking for them, but you know where they are. Uh, Brady doesn't know why Pruitt's looking for Wade, but you know why. You know, so you know everything. And hopefully the, the joy or the interest in a novel like mine will be the reader seeing when the characters learn what the reader already knows. But things like plot, what I try to do is, again, create the most interesting characters I can and look at the ways they intersect. And what are the tensions in those intersections? Because plot, this is a very, if you're a writer, anybody out there, plot boiled down is very simple. You say, what does my character want? What's in the way of that? And that is plot. It's character desire thwarted. Whatever your character wants, is it the guy, the girl, big game, you know, the party, the new car, what's in the way of that? That's the plot. And so I look at these points of tension with these characters. What do they desire? Who or what is in the way of that desire? And my plot kind of comes from there. But as far as tension, very practical things. Like, I want a chapter to close with you wondering what happens next. And I did that in my second book, and I didn't do that so well in my first book. Uh, the chapters toward the end get shorter, so I want it to move faster. Those are just kind of craft structure things. Um, but plot, you just kind of look at those points of intersection and say, how are these characters mad at each other, disappointed by one another, angry? Uh, and you, plot kind of comes from there for me. Yes, sir. Um, you were talking about how uh, you would have to tone down certain aspects of your novel uh, due to editor response or other types of criticism. Um, I was wondering, in that process, do you ever get a change of how your audience is going to, or what, you, what your aim for your audience is going to be? Like, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how um, you would go about uh, processing what your new audience or the changes to your audience would be. That's a great question. Um, early on, Pruitt was... He was dangerous, but he was comedic. He was a buffoon. And I was at a residency in New Hampshire, and they would have readings at night, and the, art, the artists in residence would read, like, like, like here, and the, the, the audience would be in the audience, other artists would be in the audience. And I read a scene from Pruitt's perspective, and people were like in tears laughing, because it was funny. And I thought, Man, I'm funny. I didn't know I, I could write funny stuff, you know. And so I stayed with that, him being this like bumbling buffoon who was capable of violence almost inadvertently. Um, and my editor was like, look, if he's a buffoon, there's no threat. What's the threat? What, what is everybody afraid of? If he's a buffoon, you're not afraid of that guy. You make fun of that guy. You don't turn the other way when you see him coming. You watch what he's going to do because it's going to make you laugh. And so that made me change Pruitt's character. And then he got really dark. And there were a lot of scenes of him being out of control. There's only a handful in the novel now. But one of the scenes that I really liked was a scene of him going to the batting cage on the day he starts looking for Wade on a Sunday. And um, it's a Sunday morning, and he says he's going to church, he's going to the batting cage. And he puts... He has a special relationship with the owners of the batting cage, and he puts real baseballs into the hopper. And so he's hitting real baseballs. And these two little boys start watching him, and uh, he busts the seams of one of the ball. He, he, he knocks the casing off the ball, and the kids are, like, blown away. And so Pruitt comes out, and they're like, can we have this? And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll sign it for you. 
and they're like, we don't want you to sign it. And he's like, no, I don't mind. I played minor league ball for the Greensboro Grasshoppers. And, blah, blah, blah. and they're like, ah, it's okay. And he says, we'll give it back. And the kids are like, you never told us you had to sign it for us to have it. We don't want to give it back. And he freaks out and, and like attacks these kids. And then their father comes running over, and he just goes crazy on the dad. He like curb kicks the dad. And my editor was like, whoa, this happens like the first 20 pages of the novel, right? So where do you go from there? I talked about peaking, and once you peak, you don't peak again. You know, so once that happens, and then you get to Wade's mother, 120 pages later, you're not shocked by it. So you, you just think about those things, like how do I want my reader to navigate this book? Where, you know, what kind of reader do I want for this book? So you, you, you're you trying not to think about those things in the writing, but in the revising and the editing, you, you, you do kind of think about that. Maybe we'll take a, take a break and have some refreshments and then come back in.